Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. Thank you for the revelation you're bringing forth. Thank you that we take hold of it. And thank you for the work you're accomplishing in this end time church and in our lives. We praise you for all you do this day in Jesus name. Amen. Please be seated if you would. As we have pointed out, this is the time of year when the seventh month on the Hebrew calendar is. And we see that today would be the day after the Feast of, Trump, Feast of Tabernacles beginning, which is the 15th day of the month. That was actually yesterday. And so we are talking about the fulfillment of the Feast of the Lord, but that's very important in all the things we've been sharing because this shows forth not only the work of Jesus Christ, but also the work in your life to accomplish what he has done. We're going to bring forth a little bit of review of some of the things we brought forth to point out how important it is to understand what he is doing. First of all, we see in Genesis chapter 8, verse 4, the ark where Noah was protected when the flood came and the judgment upon the world. It rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month. The fact that it speaks of the seventh month, it has a prophetic element to it because the final three feasts are in the seventh Hebrew month. And this is the time when the fulfillment of the work of Jesus Christ is accomplished as well as in the body of Christ. And notice it said that it rested on the mountains of Ararat. Ararat means the curse reversed. Meaning this is prophetic of what God said he was going to do. It was going to come to pass in this seventh month and it was going to reverse the curse. The curse upon the people as well as the curse upon the earth to accomplish what he purposed to liberate the, us from the evil that has come. And we know the number 17 is the number that delivers us from evil and brings a, a deliverance from all, and brings a restoration, which is what God purposes. So we're going to continue on and first of all, go back and talk about some of the things we talked about in the Feast of Trumpets. Because these three feasts, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles are the final three feasts of the seven feasts of the Lord, and they are being fulfilled in these last days. Leviticus 23, verse 24. Speaking of the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall you have a Sabbath, a memorial blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. This is the one on the seventh month first day and remember the first day is determined by the first sliver of the new moon you don't know which day it is it depends on whether it occurs uh, at, at one time or after midnight maybe the next day that's why they have a two day uh, the Israelites have a two day uh, memorial of this day this feast of trumpets but we need to look at the things that we talked about that are important what do we what did we see about this particular time Ezra chapter 3, verse 1. When the seventh month was come, the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. One man. We're, seeing, we're going to see that the body of Christ is going to come into one accord. We're going to come to the place of walking in one accord, in line with the Word of God as one. And who is this going to be? It's going to be the remnant. It's going to be the few, the ones that are chosen to follow the way of the Lord. We see that as they began to do this work, in verse 10, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with the trumpets. The foundation gets laid in our life as we're hearing and doing the word continually, as we have talked about out of Matthew chapter 7. And as we do so, we are putting on the clothing, the apparel is the clothing, putting on the garments of God by putting on the Lord Jesus Christ in our life, the Word in us. So the foundation gets laid. Speaking of you and I are to be hearing and doing the Word. In Nehemiah, we saw in chapter 8, verse 1, all the people gathered themselves together as one man again, the ones who are in tune with him are going to be as one accord with the Lord. Into the street that was before the water gate, and they spake unto Ezra the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. 
Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both the men and women, all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. So this is the time of trumpets, speaking of what this is all pointing towards for the end time church especially. He read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning, that means the light of day, dawn, until midday, that would have been 12 o'clock, so that's like six hours, hearing the word of God before men and women and those that could understand, the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. They wanted to hear the word. This speaks of the fact that you must want to hear the word and get the spiritual understanding and it takes much time of you being in the word, hearing the word, doing it and thanking him for giving you revelation. You study everything. It's little by little, here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept, no shortcuts. We must get the word in us. You should have a strong desire to want to get the word before you. Another thing that we saw, speaking of what's going to happen and what is happening in the end time church who are listening to him. Numbers chapter 10 verse 9. If you go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresses you, then you shall blow an alarm with the trumpets. You shall be remembered before the Lord your God and you shall be saved from your enemies. This also speaks of the fact this is the time for warfare spiritual warfare, to conquer all enemies in your life. Everything is to be conquered. God has given you authority over all the power of the enemy and he expects you to be completely victorious as you engage in the spiritual warfare. Another thing that we pointed out in Isaiah chapter 58, all this was involved at the time of trumpets Whenever you hear a trumpet, you know it's talking about this end time prophetically as well. He said in Isaiah 58, verse 1, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. God is coming to everyone to show them their sins, so that they can come to the place of repentance and turn away from them. They cannot continue in the ways of sin and think that they're going to be right with the Lord whatsoever. We're to conquer them, we're to eliminate them, and walk in righteousness. We also see over in Hosea, Hosea chapter 8, what happened to those that did not put the word first place. Set the trumpet to thy mouth. And that's, war that's warning them about the time that we're speaking of. And we are in the end time church. He shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord because they've transgressed my covenant and trespassed against my law. Well, that means judgment is going to come, and we know that judgment's coming to the church before it comes to the world. Israel shall cry unto me, My God, we know thee. Well, they thought that they were okay, but Israel has cast off the thing that's good, which would be the word. If we cast off the word, what's going to happen? The enemy shall pursue you, because you've given place to him and opened the door. You got to understand the devils are going to be after this end time church who are the remnant, the few. Of course, the ones that are already in sin, he's already got control of them. But if you cast away the word, he's going to come after you. You cannot let yourself cast away the word whatsoever. At the same time, as we're approaching these last days, you and I must be watchmen. Watchmen that are going to do what God says. Ezekiel chapter 33, he speaks here. Verse 2, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon the land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for a watchman, if when he sees the sword come upon the land, he blows the trumpet and warns the people. Well, that's what we're doing. We're warning everyone. The judgment's coming. The new world order is about to arise. The final evil kingdom. And we know that the judgment comes to the church beforehand. He's warning the people. Whosoever hears the sound of the trumpet takes not warning. If the sword come and take him away, his blood will be upon his own head because he didn't take heed to the warning. He heard the sound of the trumpet, took not warning. His blood will be upon him, but he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. If the watchman sees the sword come and blows not the trumpet, that means he's not given the warning out and the people be not warned. If the, warned if the sword come and take any person from among them, he's taken away in his iniquity, which he will die in, but his blood will I acquire at the watchman's hand. 
Otherwise, he didn't do what he was supposed to do. So thou, O son of man, I've set thee as a watchman in the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word of my mouth and warn them from me. We must call everybody to come in line with the word of God, people to get born again, also people that are walking in sin to come to the place of repentance. They cannot continue in sin and think that they are going to be preserved or protected. It won't happen. They're going to get wiped out. They're going to see destruction come, as we see. We also talked about the final, the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets, and that is at the end of the church age, as we pointed out, there'll be the catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout of the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. The dead in Christ are all those who are going to be coming, their spirit and soul is going to be coming from heaven, and they're going to get their bodies, glorified bodies, first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Then we immediately will get a glorified body. This is the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets, and this will occur at the end of the tribulation, actually 10 days prior to the end of it because the days are shortened because of the evil that is going on. Feast of Trumpets is 10 days before the Day of Judgment, which is the seventh month, 10th day, the Day of Atonement. We must see that we're gonna be changed. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Behold, I show you a mystery we shall not all sleep, we shall not all die, it's referring to, but we shall all be changed in, the mo in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, that's that seventh trumpet sounding, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Corruption, corruptible must put on incorruption, the mortal must put on immortality. That's what's going to happen for everyone who is in Christ at that point in time. So we see the tremendous things that are pointed out, and for the end time church, we're to be one of the few, the remnant, they're gonna become one with the Lord. We're gonna want the word and get the word in us. We're gonna get the foundation of the temple laid because we hear and do the word. We're gonna engage in warfare. We're gonna see all the areas of our sin and deal with all transgressions. We're not about to cast off the word or we know the enemy is gonna be after us and we're gonna see destruction come. And we will warn the wicked and warn everyone that they must come in line with the word so their blood will not be upon our hands. We're responsible to give out the word of God to people. Then we come to the next one, which is the Day of Atonement, which we talked about on Wednesday, and we want to talk more about this today. Understanding not only the work of Jesus, but also the work in the end time church. Leviticus 23, verse 27, also on the 10th day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you afflict or humble, this really means, your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. They're to be holy for the day of atonement. That is the day of judgment. But the day of atonement is not just a day of judgment because we look over in Leviticus 25 and we see in verse 9, it speaks of another thing on the 10th day of the seventh month. Look what it says. Then thou shalt cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the 10th day of the seventh month in the day of atonement shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. And the word land actually means, or it's a retz, means all the earth. There is no your there, shouldn't be there. I'll show you. Here it says, this is the blowing of the trumpet in the whole earth. I'm not talking about just their land, it's the whole earth. The trumpet is blowing for every single person, remember, because the Jubilee is going to come to all mankind through the work of Jesus Christ. And so this is on the 10th day of the seventh month. What's supposed to happen then? You're going to howl the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land and to all the inhabitants thereof. It's what brings liberty. Not judgment, but liberty is what's coming first. It shall be a Jubilee unto you, and you shall return every man to his possession. All his possessions are restored. And you should return every man unto his family. He comes back into the family. 
speaking of the fact that we come in back into the spiritual family when we get born again and come back in relationship with the Father and we become a firstborn. It goes on. The Jubilee shall that 50th year be unto you. And then we see in verse 13, in the year of Jubilee you shall return every man unto his possession. So the year of Jubilee was also here, this is the seventh month, tenth day, the time of when the liberty would come, the return of all possessions, return to the family. And that's what we see, as you will see, the first fulfillment is Jesus bringing the Jubilee, the liberty, the restoration of all things. And then the second fulfillment will be the judgment that will come. And we know the judgment is going to come. And this judgment, first of all, remember, comes to the church. First Peter chapter 4, verse 17. The time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. If it first begin at us, what shall the end be of those obeying not the gospel of God? The, if the righteous, and those are the ones that are born again and doing righteousness, that show themselves to be righteous by the fruits of righteousness, with difficulty and not easily, are being saved, remember. This is the present tense, are being saved ongoingly as they're walking in righteousness by God's work in their life because of passive voice. Where shall the ungodly and the sinful ones appear? <laughs> they're in trouble. They're all going to be in trouble. The judgment will come. But then we know also that the judgment will also come, the fulfillment of this, in the Day of Atonement judgment, which is a judgment. Revelation chapter 16, verse 14, speaks of the spirits of devils working miracles that go forth into the kings of the earth and the whole world, the whole inhabited earth, this means, to gather them to the battle, that great day of God Almighty. There is going to be that day, which is the judgment. And they are going to gather together. The devils are going to gather them together to try to fight. Of course, this speaks of what's going to happen prior to that. Behold, I come as a thief. And what's that? To catch us. I was the thief means suddenly, when the rapture, the catching up of the church is. Blessed is he who is watching. We've got to be watching and keeping our garments so we are holy and righteous before him. Lest he might walk unclothed. This means unclad. Well, if you don't have the clothing, the spiritual clothing on, you're not going to be right with God. And they see a shame, nakedness, which means they would be able to come to you and bring destruction against you if you're not clothed. He gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Of course, this is what will happen the ten days later. And this is the place where there's going to be the destruction is going to occur. We see in chapter 19, in verse 19, I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against them that sat on the horse and against his army. What do you see throughout the world right now? All these nations are getting ready for war. They're all preparing for war, aren't they? It's going to be a step-by-step -step process and they're all going to be prepared for war because there's going to be all kinds of wars occurring down the road. The beast was taken with him, the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. They'll be cast directly into it. The remnant, all the rest of them, were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse. This is the judgment upon the nations. Which sword proceeded out of his mouth and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. The absolute destruction will come. And this is also the time when Satan is going to be locked up. Revelation 20, verse 1, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. He will be bound for a thousand years. And all those who are in Christ, the ones that are the few, the remnant, the ones that are, have come and passed the test, the holy ones, the ones that are true disciples, the ones that are righteous before him, they're going to be the ones that are going to be with the Lord, serving Him and reigning with Him for the thousand years in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Now, in talking about this first coming, when Jesus brings this 
fulfillment of the Day of Atonement, this liberty, this rest restoration. We need to see this again. We looked at this before I want to, on Wednesday. We want to look at it again so you understand this clearly. A beginning of the gospel, which means the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Who came first after the prophetic voice was silent for all those 434 years of the 62 weeks, remember, about Daniel's prophecy? They didn't heard a thing. But now the prophet John the Baptist comes on the scene. It's written in the prophets, Behold, I'll send the messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. This is John the Baptist coming. And it's very significant what he does here in verse 4. John, not did baptize, but this is the word ginnomai, often translated become, but in this case would mean because of the fact that baptize is a, is a participle, present participle, meaning he was baptizing, as Young's brings forth. Young's translates it came baptizing. I would translate more. John appeared baptizing suddenly on the scene in the wilderness. And he's baptizing. And then he's also proclaiming. Preach means to be proclaiming. And this was ongoingly. He's proclaiming to them all. Not the baptism, but a baptism. Here's the proclaiming. There's the word baptism. No definite article in between. He's proclaiming a baptism. That's important. We're not talking about the baptism. We're talking about a baptism, which you'll see what it is in a moment, of repentance. Repentance is a word which means a change of mind. It's the word from metanoe. And it's talking about the, the change of mind that is going to cause some result. Because it goes on and says, ice, not for, means into, not the, into a, again, that remission. remission. This was, there's no definite article before it either. Into remission. This means remission. There's remission. And this particular word means a release from bondage and imprisonment of sins. Well, that's important. Having heard and seen what he's proclaiming and what he is doing, what did this speak to the Israelites? Huh. They knew that the new day was coming. They knew the Messiah was showing up. They knew that they now were all going to become priests. And they also knew by him proclaiming that they're not going to be in, a, in bondage or imprisonment to sins. That means something had to happen on the inside of them. This is a tremendous statement that John the Baptist made. And they understood what was, go what was going to happen, but they didn't understand how, or all the facts about it, of course. But they understood the prophecy back in Exodus chapter 19, verse 5. Now therefore, if you obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, you'll be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you'll speak on the children of Israel. So this means they're going to come into the priesthood, and they're going to come into a kingdom. And they're going to be a holy nation. Were they anything as that, like that then? No. Who were the priests then? Just the one tribe of Levi. But now he's speaking to all of them. That means everybody's going to be a priest. And everybody's going to be coming into a kingdom. And they're all going to be a holy nation. And he also speaks of them to be a peculiar treasure. Well, this particular word here where it talks about a peculiar treasure this, when you see this word, this is what the word is in the Hebrew. It's a word which means your personal property. And it really comes from these Hebrew, your, your, your Gritic, Aramaic, Akkadian. <clears throat> these, all these words show the same thing. It's about acquiring property, and it becomes your personal property. Well, that shows the fact that we're going to be these people were going to be an acquired people. They're going to be a special valued property, a peculiar treasure unto God. Was mankind anything like that at that time? No. He was spiritually dead. 
He was not walking right whatsoever. He was not alive unto God. And furthermore, this told them all were going to be priests. And they couldn't be that under the Old Testament, so that meant there had to be a new covenant coming. And they weren't in the kingdom. That meant a kingdom is coming as well and to become a holy nation. So we go back to Mark chapter 4, <clears throat> and we see what he's saying. He's saying a tremendous thing to them. He's declaring, proclaiming a baptism of a change of mind that would result in, into a release from bondage and imprisonment of sins. That meant no more bondage, imprisonment of sins. That means they're not going to be a sinner anymore because they were a sinner. In fact, because they were in bondage and prison to sins as a sinner, how, what was their thought throughout their life? Jesus came to deliver them who through fear of death, they had fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage as a slave because they were slave to sin and they knew where their destiny was. Their destiny was going down to hell. Even the ones who were counted righteous were in Abraham's bosom, the upper compartment of hell, but nonetheless, they were imprisoned in hell. So, this means we're not going to be a sinner any longer. So he's proclaiming the first fulfillment of the Day of Atonement is what he's proclaiming here, back in Mark chapter 1. He's essentially declaring the fulfillment of the seventh month, tenth day jubilee. Liberty is coming. You're going to be restored to the family of God. You're going to see your possessions be returned. You are going to be liberated from all bondages, and you're going to come to the place of total freedom and liberty. Now, he also then says, says down here in verse, of course, verse 5, all the people came out. They were being baptized of him. And then he makes another statement down in verse 8. I indeed baptize you with water. That's what was done as the first step into the priesthood. They understood that in the Old Testament. And, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. See, the first means into the priesthood. There were three steps. The first one was the washing or the baptism or the washing with water. Aaron brought son, Aaron, Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with the water. That was the first step. The second step was the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Oil poured upon them. And the third step was the application of the blood to the tip of their right ear, the thumb of the right hand, and the great toe of their right foot, which would be showing about their sins being dealt with. So, here we see, as we go back here, this means that when we see back in Mark what he's talking about, after saying all that to him, proclaiming this liberty, it's coming, and he tells them how it's going to happen this time, because it said it was a baptism of a change of mind into you're going to have a change of mind. It's going to bring you into this release from bondage and imprisonment of sins. And then he's telling them, yeah, I baptize you with water. That's how you come in the priesthood. But he, the one you're going to believe on, who's coming after, as he mentioned, there's one who comes mightier after me, the latchet of whose shoes I'm not worthy to stoop down and unloose. He's declaring the Messiah is coming. This one is going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. So, this also meant there's a change in, in, the, in the way you come into the priesthood. You're not going to be coming in through washing with water. You're now going to be coming in through a baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is going to bring forth a change on the inside of the person, so they're not any longer a, in bondage imprisonment of sins any longer. They're not a sinner any longer. It's a new way into the priesthood, and it's going to make this baptism is not going to make them a sinner any longer. He's proclaiming what Jesus comes to do in the Day of Atonement, fulfillment of the liberty that he's going to bring forth. And this is a spiritual baptism. And remember what the baptism of the Holy Spirit does. It brings the new birth. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we're Jews or Gentiles. So here he says, everybody's baptized into one body. What's the body? The body of Christ, when you get born again. So when he's also proclaiming this back here in Mark chapter 1 about this change of mind, well, what was this 
John's this baptism of repentance that Jesus that John spoke of. What was that all about? Well, in Acts chapter 19, it explains what it would be, which will show you what the change of mind is referring to. Acts 19, verse 3, this is when Paul found some disciples at Ephesus, and he, of course, said, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And they didn't even know about any Holy Spirit. So he asked them, what then were you baptized? What, unto what then were you baptized? They said, unto John's baptism. That's all they knew. Then he explains what it is. John verily baptized with a baptism, not the, a, as Young's brings out, a baptism of repentance, the same thing that he was talking about. And what was this? Saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. So this change of mind was to believe on Jesus. And when they would believe on Jesus, what happens? You get born again. And that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So this, when it speaks, he's speaking his baptism of repentance, it's a change of mind to believe on Jesus. Not talking about your sins whatsoever. It's talking about changing your mind and believing on Jesus so that you're born again. And when they heard that, they were ready to obey. When they heard this, they were baptized immediately. That's spiritual. This, this is baptism by the Holy Spirit into the name of the Lord Jesus. They came into relationship with him. You call upon the name of the Lord and you get born again. They were in, into, this means ice, the name of the Lord Jesus. This is not water baptism because this happened immediately when they heard it. When they heard it, they were baptized. It happened at right instantly at that point. That is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This means when one receives Jesus, the baptism of the Holy Spirit occurs immediately. It brings you into the New Testament priesthood and it brings you to the place of being released from the spiritual bondage of imprisonment of being a sinner. So that you're bound by sins because you're a sinner. That's why they were bound by it. So this is a new baptism that he's proclaiming. What's he proclaiming? John the Baptist proclaiming in Mark chapter 1, verse 4, when you understand what's actually being said, he's proclaiming the fulfillment of Acts 19, verse 5 and 6, and which is the liberty. Because remember, in the third month, that's the time of Pentecost. That's the time when the Feast of Weeks was changed to the name Pentecost, which means 50th. And what's the 50th? Jubilee. Otherwise, the Jubilee is coming forth. He is proclaiming the fulfillment of the Jubilee. Now, we have to also understand what Jesus was doing, of course. Remember that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45, it says this. So it's written, the first man, Adam, he was made a living soul. He was the first man that came from God. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit or a life-giving spirit. Who's the last Adam? Jesus. The first Adam was the first one that God made. The next one was one that came from heaven. The first man was out of the earth, earthy. The second man, who's that? That's the second one that came, who was a man who was Originally, we're talking about in relationship with God, just like the first man was until he sinned. The second man is the Lord. He's out of heaven. He comes. And so here he comes. And what's he coming to do? He's coming to bring the liberty. And that's actually what it is speaking of here when we look over in 1 John chapter 3. People have not understood this. Verse 8. Where it says, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. Why did he come? Not that he might destroy the works of the devil, because this isn't the word for destroy. It's the word luo, which means to loose, or more accurately here, it means to undo. He was loosing. If you loose something, you untie it or you undo it, you, you, uh, in a sense. You undo, I guess, the, I guess it was in the other... You do away, you not do away with, that's a mistake. It really means to undo or to, to loose something, to really undo it would be the better way, really, in understanding what this is saying. Because did he destroy the works of the devil? No, the works of the devil are still here. 
But what did he do? He undid the works of the devil so man could get free, which means what is he doing? He's bringing the liberty. He's bringing the manifestation. You got to understand the Day of Atonement is not all about judgment. Everybody's thought that. That's error. They have failed to understand the first coming is liberty, restoration in all things. And that was ongoing because it happened there when he came in his ministry for three and a half years, but it's ongoing through the church age. It's Pentecost, ongoing, liberty that he brings forth. And so we see, we go back to Mark chapter 1, and we see the time when all this happened. So you understand what's all being said. After verse 8, where he said he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost, here Jesus comes to Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John. And then here when he was baptized, the Spirit, Holy Spirit, came and descended upon him, came upon him for his ministry. And then the Spirit then immediately drives him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil for 40 days. Why is that? Because remember, the first Adam failed, the first man. Well, what did the second man have to do? He had to pass the test because the temptations were going to come against him. And Jesus, of course, is the one who did that. For 40 days, he went through the temptation there. And we know, as it says in Hebrews chapter 4, Verse 15, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. He was tempted in everything, and he came through, of course, victorious. Then we go back to Mark and to understand what's continuing on to be said. After the temptation, John got put in prison because the devil went after him right away after his ministry, what he brought forth, proclaiming the, the fulfillment now we come to verse 15. Jesus is speaking here. He says, the time has been fulfilled. First of all, the time means the fixed and definite time. Not is fulfilled at that moment. It has been fulfilled in the past with present results at the time of speaking because it's a perfect tense verb, which is important to understand. So, the, set, the fixed, definite time has been fulfilled. What time? What time is he talking about? It was a time that was already set. What time was that? This is where we have to understand about Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy. Daniel chapter 9. So you understand how all this ties together. And Daniel 9, 25, Know therefore and understand the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah, the ruler. Prince means the ruler. And how is he going to rule as the king in the kingdom? It'll be seven weeks and three score weeks. The seven weeks were the, the set weeks of years, 49 years, up to the end of Malachi's ministry. And then the three score and two weeks, 62 weeks, which is 434 years, which is the silent years, no prophetic voice. Those are 69 weeks brought until the time when Messiah, the ruler, would come on the scene. And so that's 483 years. It began with the, his, the, the going forth of the commandment to restore and build was by Artaxerxes in 458 B.C. We go 483 years and we come to 26 A.D. 26 A.D. is when Jesus was operating now and beginning, he manifested himself and began his rule and reign. And what would this be in fulfillment of? Also, it's going to be in fulfillment of the Day of Atonement, the Day of Atonement liberty that was going to come forth. Because remember, that was the first, first fulfillment of the Day of Atonement is bringing forth the liberty. And of course, Jesus was going to do that. Also, he spoke of another thing here, so you understand why he said this. He's just not just saying words out here. They're important. The set time for him to be manifested and also for the fulfillment of the seventh month, tenth day, beginning fulfillment of the Jubilee, the liberty, has been fulfilled. And the kingdom of God has come near has arrived, has come near. Same thing, perfect tense, but this time it's active. 
The other was passive because that time was fulfilled here as it elapsed. But here, this is talking about the kingdom of God has come near. And where's the kingdom of God operating? In Jesus. And what kingdom is this? This is the kingdom from heaven. The kingdom of God from heaven that he brought. And he's the one now. It's come nigh. And what's he going to do? He's going to rule and reign. What's going to bring the liberty? His rule and reign. Casting out the devils, healing the sick, setting people free from bondages, delivering them from all the evil, operating in the rule and the reign of God. Remember, Messiah, the ruler, comes on the scene to rule and to reign. And you've got to also understand, people say, well, this is, is a kingdom from heaven? That's right. Remember what Jesus said in John 18, verse 36. My kingdom, it's not of this world. It wasn't a kingdom of the world. He wasn't operating a kingdom on earth or under the covenant, or any old covenant thing. No, there wasn't one. He's operating in the kingdom from heaven. If my kingdom were this world, my servants would fight, but I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom, not from hence, not from this place. It's from heaven. He is operating, bringing the, the rule and the reign of God from heaven. Because remember, even though the earth was given into the hands of men in a form of a lease for the 6,000 years, it didn't belong to them. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It belongs to him. He's the owner. The Lord's the owner. And the owner's coming to the one who now has the lease, who's an enemy, to bring forth the liberty to all the people and to bring also a liberty to earth to take back over it when the lease is up. Of course, he can't violate the lease. That's why he couldn't do anything for the 6,000 years, remember. And the lease, remember, was the 120 jubilees. Now, at the same time, what kind of a kingdom is Satan operating in? He does have a kingdom, you know. There are two kingdoms in operation at the present time, but his is not a kingdom, of course, from heaven. His kingdom is of the earth. Matthew 12, 26. If the, Satan cast out Satan, he's divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? So he has a kingdom, but this is only the kingdom of the inhabited earth. We know this because of the statement that he made in Luke chapter 4, verse 5. The devil, taken up in a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the inhabited earth. Notice the word, inhabited earth, not world, in a moment of time. These are all the, the rule, the, the reign of earth that he had as a right as having the lease to rule and reign. This is not. But at the same time, they are also called the kingdoms of this world in the temptation. He said the kingdoms of the inhabited earth in Luke. But here he says he took them up and he showed them all the kingdoms of the world. And this means world, cosmos. So these are the kingdoms of the world, the kingdoms of the inhabited earth. But the kingdom, the real kingdom, that's going to rule and reign is the kingdom that comes from heaven. And Jesus brought that kingdom. And so what is he telling them now? Again, he's saying, I am the fulfillment of the, full, the day of atonement, liberty, jubilee. He's coming. That time's been fulfilled. Daniel's prophecy and also the time for the fulfillment of the jubilee. The rule and reign of God has come. And remember, he has to repent. They, they have to repent. A, a baptism of repentance. They have to have a change of mind into this, this what was going to happen to release them from the bondage and prison of sins, become a priest, no longer be a sinner. But what do they need to do? This is a command to everybody. He's commanding every single person, change your mind. Every, single, every person must change their mind and they must believe the gospel. This is a command just as well to everyone. When you present the gospel, you present the gospel, the good news, you don't talk about them changing their, repenting of their sins. That's not what's necessary. They need to believe the gospel and receive Jesus and be born from above so they can get a brand new spirit. And that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So he's proclaiming this. 
Now, over we see also, this was the fulfillment of this jubilee, remember. So when is this going to occur? It's going to occur on the day of atonement, which is the time when the jubilee would be fulfilled. It's going to begin at that time. We come back over to Luke chapter 3, verse 16. Here's where he was baptized, spoke of being baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Same context. Verse 21, all the people were baptized. Jesus is baptized as well. Verse 22, the Holy Spirit descends in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. So here's the anointing of the Holy Spirit coming upon him. And another thing which we're for what we're approaching, because we're going to talk about the time of the Tabernacles, Feast of Tabernacles, which is the next one, but also the time of the birth of Jesus, which is important, because look at the next thing it says. Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. He wasn't quite 30 years of age. This isn't really a good translation, and I haven't seen any translations that translate it right, because this word here, it can mean begin, the first, but it also means the ruler beginning to rule, because it comes from this word, I don't know why it won't come up. Which means the chief leader rule. So this is, means Jesus himself was beginning to rule about nearly, more would be better, 30 years of age. Well, that tells you this is pretty close to his birthday then. And also this is the fulfillment of the Jubilee at the same time. Because you need to understand the, the day, the time of the birth of Jesus, so you don't believe the lie, thinking it's December 25th, which is an absolute abomination. So we see that Jesus was continually ruling. That's what, and this is when he's doing this. Well, we see in chapter four. Here he goes in the wilderness. He's tempted the devil for all those times. After he finishes the temple, the temptation. He comes back by the, from the devil. He, of course, passes the test that Adam had failed, returns in the power of the Spirit. And now what's he ready to do? He's now, because he did this for 40 days, and it began with Elul 1, 30 days of repentance, the month of, month of Elul, the month of repentance. And then 10 days is the time from the first day to the 10th day, which is the time when it comes to the Day of Atonement. So that's 30 plus 10 is 40 days. And so he had accomplished that, and he finished the temptation then. And what begins immediately then on the seventh month, tenth day? This is when Jesus then goes forth and he begins to teach in their synagogues. And what's he doing? He's teaching them the gospel, and he's speaking to them about the good news and the fulfillment of the Jubilee, that he is the one who is bringing the liberty to everybody. And after he speaks, he speaks, begins speaking this, he comes to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up, and custom was, he went in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. This is on the Sabbath day, because the day there in that time, in 26 AD, the Sabbath day wasn't the day that was the seventh month, tenth day. It was a different day. It was the thirteenth day. In fact, we can even show you this. This is in 26 AD. The calendar. And here is Tishri. This is Tishri, and this is Tishri day 10. That's Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Then the 13th day would be the Saturday, three days later. So this is the day when he would have started his ministry. This is three days later when he's in the Sabbath, and he's going to say something that's related back to when it started, as you'll see. I wanted to show you, in 26 AD, it w the seventh month, tenth day was not on the Sabbath. It was on a Wednesday, three days prior to that when he was there. So, he comes to Nazareth, stood up to read. They delivered him the book of the prophet Isaiah. I opened up the book, found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel, the good news of the poor, set me to heal the brokenhearted, preach deliverance to the captives, recovering the sight of the blind, set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. What's the acceptable year? Jubilee. He's declaring the Jubilee. That's why we must understand in the first coming, Jesus 
did not bring judgment. He brought liberty. He accomplished this. And when did he start this? On the seventh month, tenth day. How do we know that? We read on. He closed the book, gave it to the minister, sat down. The eyes of all of them were on the synagogue, were fastened on him. He began to say to them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Does that mean it was fulfilled that day? No. How do we know? You have to look up the tense voice and mood. Perfect tense, that's critical, because the perfect tense means completed action in the past with present results at the time of speaking, meaning this scripture was, has been fulfilled of the jubilee coming into manifestation in the past, which was what, three days before, on that Wednesday, which is the seventh month, tenth day. And now he's declaring it's been fulfilled and I'm bringing it to you today. He was bringing the fact that he was the fulfillment of the Jubilee. He started his ministry on the Day of Atonement, which was him the ruler, remember? He is the ruler. And of course, were they ready to receive him? <laughs> no. Though they wondered the gracious words. But then he comes and says, Physician, heal, that you're going to say, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever you've heard in Capernaum, do also here in, in, in thy country. No prophets except in his own country. And of course, that meant that there were hardly anybody that were going to receive his ministry at all. And that's exactly right. Because this is Nazareth. Could he do much at Nazareth? Matthew chapter 13, verse 52. It says, Was it, was it Matthew? Or did I say get the wrong one? Did I write the wrong thing down? I'm sorry, 58, wrong, wrong thing. He did not many works there because of their unbelief. He couldn't do anything. They were in unbelief. And we see also he could only do a little bit. This is in Mark's account, chapter 6, verse 5. He could do their no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. They didn't receive his ministry at all. And that's the true about the Jews continually. They didn't receive his ministry. Only a few received. And then he goes on. So you understand what he, why he's saying what he's saying. In Luke chapter 4, verse 25, I tell you the truth, many widows were in Israel in the day of Elias, when this heaven was shut up three years and six months, and great famine was throughout all the land. Many widows, oh, they would have all been needed to come to. And there's only one that he came to, the woman that was the one, this one woman here. This is from Sarepta. Only one, only a few. And then he says the same thing here. There are many lepers. They would all needed healing. But who got cleansed? Only one, Naaman, the Syrian, because he's the only one that would respond to him, remember, and do the things that he said he was supposed to do. Jesus came ruling in the kingdom of God from heaven, and he's proclaiming the good news, the liberty. He is the fulfillment of the feast of, or of the Day of Atonement, the liberty, the Jubilee. That was his first coming. Now, having said all that, we want to come to the next part because we want to talk about the birth of Jesus and begin to talk about tabernacles. Because remember, this is all pointing towards the end time work in the church. We saw all the things that in trumpets. We see the liberty coming. And this is what he's coming in the end time church. He's raising up a church that is going to be one of the few, the remnant, that are going to walk in his ways, that are going to be holy. They're going to be ones that are going to be righteous before him. The ones that are going to get delivered, they're going to get healed. They're going to see this tremendous liberty come to their life to bring them out of all bondage. They're going to conquer all sin in their life. They're going to be holy. They're going to go on into perfection. And this is what is coming right now as God is working you to get you ready for be a part of this glorious church. The glory of God is going to be poured out on. Luke 23, 34, the 15th day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for the seven days. Now, in the fulfillments of these, because we already talked about the fulfillment of the Feast of the Trumpets in, in, in the 
fulfillment in the body of Christ is all the things that he's doing to bring them to become in line with his ways. And we saw the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets in the, uh, in the rapture of the church caught up to meet him. Well, in this also we saw the, the two fulfillments in the Day of Atonement. First, he come in and bring in the liberty and return to the family and return of all possessions. <clears throat> and then the final one will be the judgment. And by the way, that liberty was ongoing all the way through. It's still going on today. It's still working. But then we come to the Feast of Tabernacles, and it has three fulfillments. The first fulfillment is the birth of Jesus. You must understand this. John, chapter 1, verse 14. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory was the only begotten of the Father. Who is Jesus? Well, before He was Jesus, He was the Word in heaven. We know that there are three, it says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, He's the second person of the Godhead, and the Holy Ghost. And literally, when it says these three are one, it's really, you kind of lose it a little bit. It's better to understand, it says, and these, the plural demonstrative pronoun, these, the three. Not these three, but these, the three, which really points out the three persons of the Godhead by saying the three, these, they're one. They are one. That's the word for one. So that shows you that there's three different persons of the Godhead, but they're all one in unity, carrying out the ministry because the whole Godhead is, El remember, he's Elohim, God. In fact, understanding, so you never fall for any of the lies that try to tell you that God is just one person. It's a lie. Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God. What's the word? Elohim. Plural. The plurality of the Godhead. Is there a singular form of Elohim? Yeah, it's Eloah. It's used from time to time, very few times in the Old Testament compared to Elohim. Elohim is the word for the plurality of the Godhead. It's used about 2,606 times throughout. And of course, we see the plurality of the Godhead, so you never deceived about this in Genesis 1.26. God said, let us, plural pronoun, make man in our image, after our likeness. That is the plurality of the Godhead. At the same time, we see the Israelites, they didn't do their due diligence in studying like they should. Their great confession is Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And they think that means just one. Not so. This actually proves that they're wrong. The word the Lord is Jehovah or Yahweh, referring to the existing one or it's the covenant-keeping name of the Lord. It's actually what it is. Because all the compound names, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Nisi, all these ones are all talking about the covenant, covenant promises that he will perform. Our Elohim, plural, is not just one singular. This is the word akkad, and the word akkad is a compound unity. We cover that in depth in the book that I wrote on the tri understanding the triunity of the Godhead. This is a compound unity. They should have never missed it. He is a compound unity. Well, let's talk about the birth of Jesus now. Remember what we saw. We know it's close to the time of when he was having, going for the, uh, for the 40 days and being tempted because that was the time right before he goes in to be tempted. It says he began to be reigning when he was about 30 years of age. Well, when did he begin to be reigning, this beginning to rule? Well, that was on the seventh month, tenth day when he's operating in the kingdom bringing forth the kingdom of God. That would have been, that's what it's referring to here. 
because that's when he began to reign after the temptation. So this is really speaking of when he began to rule, which would have been the seventh month, tenth day. So that's during the time of the seventh month. But he's not quite 30 years of old age. So that means his birthday is after that. But he's all nearly that, so it must be pretty close to it. That's right. It is. Now, when is the birthday of Jesus then? You need to know this so you can help people to come to repentance from involvement with December 25th because it is an abomination to God. John 1.14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The word dwelt is the word skenoo, which means to tabernacle. Well, that's showing you just by what it means. He's the coming to bring the fulfillment, the first fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles is the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, when would, uh, can we see this from the scripture when it was? Sure. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. It came to pass in those days there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. This taxing was first made when Cyrus was governor of Syria. All went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. Well, they had to go to their own city. <clears throat> Joseph went up to Galilee out of Nazareth and Judea in the city of David called Bethlehem. He was the house and lineage of David. Well, when else did they go to their city into the, when they had to come in for the feasts each time? So what would be the smart thing for, the, for them to do? Make the tax at the same time that they had to come for the feasts because they had to come in for that anyway. So they're in there and they're going to pay their tax at the same time. They make sure everybody will be there and they're going to get their money. And that's exactly what they did to be taxed with Mary as espoused wife, being great with child. So, that shows that it was the time of the tax. By the way, they would never have them coming to, to, for the tax if it was during the rainy season. The rainy season in Israel begins in November and goes through February. So this would have been prior to the beginning of November. Then we come to verse 6. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. She brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Two things we need to see. Number one, there was no room for them in the inn. Why was that? Because all the rooms were taken. Why would all the rooms be taken? Because everybody had to come in for the time of not only the tax, but also the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. And so that shows you that it was the time of the Feast of Tabernacles because all the rooms were taken. Also, the word here refers to, and we'll see this uh, in, we could actually look at it in, um, this is also referred to as the Feast of Booze. Leviticus 23, when it talks about here in verse 39, they gather the fruit in, and they would bring all these trees. They had gathered all these goodly trees, all these different trees, and they brought them in. And they would dwell in booths for seven days. What were the booths? Temporary residences. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't like a permanent residence whatsoever. Well, what was Jesus born in? Was he born in a, in a place that maybe you might normally think you're going to be born? No. How do we know? Because what is a manger? A manger, it's been translated four times, but what really is it? It's a stall. It was an animal stall. Where do we see that? We actually see it used that in Luke chapter 13, verse 15, when Jesus said, You hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath lose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? So where was Jesus born? He was born in an animal stall. <laughs> That's a temporary dwelling place. When would that have been? At the time, that's the Sukkot or the booth, which is the time in tabernacles. Jesus was born at tabernacles. Also, why else was Jesus born then? Luke chapter 2, verse 8. They were in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. 
So the sheep are out in the field and the shepherds are watching over them. Well, in, in Israel, the shepherds kept their sheep out until the time of the rainy season. Then they brought them in when it was the time of the rainy season. This is before the rainy season because they're still out there. So that means also it was at the time of the tabernacles. So the five reasons so far, it was the time of the tax. The shepherds were out in the field. There's no room in the inn. It's tabernacles. And he's in a stall, a temporary dwelling place. And it's all, just what we saw in John 1.14. He came and dwelt, tabernacled with us. That is the first fulfillment. People say, well, that still doesn't prove it to me. Well, we can prove it another way. In Luke chapter 1, we see about the birthday of John the Baptist. Luke chapter 1, verse 24. After those days, the, his wife Elizabeth conceived. All right, so this is the conception of Elizabeth, which was bearing John the Baptist. We come to verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of, of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. The angel came into her and said, Hail thou art highly favored, the Lord's with thee, blessed art thou among women. And what's going to happen? It's going, she's going to be having a child. This is six months. So what does that mean? Six months that there was the six months pregnancy there, the time of the, from the conception, we mean six months before she was going to conceive of Elizabeth, six months of Elizabeth, and then the nine months from the time that Mary would be conceived until the time she gave birth. So otherwise, the beginning of the conception was six months before, so that's six months, plus the full nine months would be 15 months. So the 15 months from the conception of John the Baptist would show us when the birth of Jesus was. So here's when the angel comes, and, and so she tells him that she, what's going to happen. She's going to be having a child. And we come down to, let's go down to verse 56. And we see that Elizabeth, here at Mary abode with her about three months, this is when Elizabeth was still pregnant. And Elizabeth full time came that she should be delivered, and she brought forth a son. What this tells you is that it's significant. The Bible doesn't leave anything out. The full time means it wasn't like any premature birth. You say, well, how do you know? Maybe it was born earlier or whatever. No, it was full term. Full term occurred. So we also know the same thing was true with Mary because we see in Luke 2, 6, while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. Otherwise, the full term for her just as well. So if we can figure out the time of the conception of Elizabeth, then we know 15 months later was the birth of Jesus. Well, how can we know what that is? We can know that. Because Luke chapter 1, verse 5. There were in the days of Herod the king of Judea, certain priests named Zechariah, so the course, or the service means, of Abiah, also called Abijah. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, her name was Elizabeth. So, this is the, talking about a priest who carries out the service as a priesthood in the course of Abiah. We come down here to verse 8. Came to pass while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course. According to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple and in uh, the Lord. He appeared unto him, the angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense and he says, Fear not, Zacharias, thy prayer is heard. Thy wife Elizabeth shall bear a son, and you'll call his name John. So the announcement is now that he is going to have the child. Well, then what do we have to know? We have to know when this course was and when it was over, because that would have been when the conception would have occurred. The way we know when these courses were is we go back. It's all in the Word. The Word leaves nothing out. 1 Chronicles 24, these are the divisions of the sons of Aaron and the sons of Aaron, all these ones and they, all the things that they had to do. Verse 5, they were divided by lot, all these ones, and they had to carry out all the service of the Lord. Verse 7, this, the verse lot was talking about each one's place where they would carry out the service. 
and it starts listing them out. Here's the first guy, here's the second guy, and the third and fourth and fifth and sixth. Now we come down to the eighth. Notice the eighth is Abijah, which is what it is, Abiah. So what that means is the eighth course was the one of Abiah. And these ones were half months courses. Each one, they would be for half month, and the next one would be for half month. So the eighth course would be the second half of the fourth Hebrew month. First and one and two would have been the first month. Three and four, second month. Five and six, third month. Seventh and eighth, fourth month. And so now we have that. So if we can determine when this is, we can know this. So this is the Hebrew calendar again. If we look at the Hebrew calendar, <clears throat> we see that the fourth month is called Tammuz, if you see it here. And this is parallel to the time here at the end of, actually the end of June, this is the end of June occurring, and into July. Which means that when he would have finished his course, he would have been, it would have been in July, somewhere after the first couple weeks of that, he would have finished his course somewhere in the middle here of July. So, if around the 15th or so, we go 15 months, hold 12 months, and then we go three more months, August, September, October. What is around October 15th? Tabernacles. When was Jesus born? Tabernacles. He very well might have been born on the 17th day. Why do we say that? Because we know that 17 is the number of reversing the curse, getting rid of the evil, and that's exactly what we saw, that the ark, and who is the ark? Jesus is the, it's the manifest presence of God coming, and he came, and the seventh month when he's born, and it very well could have been the 17th day to bring forth the curse being reversed upon the earth and upon mankind. So this is the first fulfillment of Jesus Christ accomplishing this. But then there's more fulfillments that are coming. Of course, he carries out his liberty throughout, and we'll be looking at all the different things that happen regarding t tabernacles in the body of Christ this evening. But let's look at the, as we see the fulfillment, what's going to be the second fulfillment? The second fulfillment is going to be when the millennial reign comes. But prior to that, let's just mention something. That prior to that, there's going to be the judgment on the church, remember. And the church is going to be raised up, the glorious church, end time church, that's going to see the glory of God poured out upon it. And in understanding the Feast of Tabernacles, it was seven days, but then there was an eighth day, the last day, they called it, the great day of the feast. In John 7, 37, the last day, the great day of the feast, that's the eighth day, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture says, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. That means rivers, rivers of living water are going to come out of this church at the end of the tabernacles, the eighth day. That's when the glory of God has been poured out and the rivers of living water, because the rivers already come into the body of Christ. Remember, you've got to become a river. And how do you become a river? Because you become a water pot filled up with the water up to the brim. That's all that's in you. Just like what was in the, the, the tabernacle, when, uh, you know, the, the ark when they pulled it out. All there were, just the two tables of stone, only the Word. The Word's to be in you. And what is the Word going to be in you? It's going to cause rivers of living water to come out of you because all that's in you is the Word. <clears throat> so, and this is exactly also what Hagehi talks about. And we talked about this in the past, but by remembrance, here it says, look at what it says, Hagehi 2, 1, in the seventh month, uh, that pricks up our ears right away, the one and twentieth day of the month, what's that? Last day of, ta of tabernacles. Ah, oh, this is talking about the end. The end, end work accomplished in the body of Christ. The word of the Lord comes to him. And he's talking about these ones and the residue is the, rem the rest, the remainder or the remnant. And what's, he says, who's left among you is all this house in her first glory. Talking about the early church. How do you see it now? It's nothing. 
Is it not in your eyes in comparison as of nothing? Get strong and also be doing. Asa is the word here. Every one of us are to get strong. Every one of us are to be hearers and doers of the word in order to establish the foundation in our life. And he says, yet once it's a little while and I'll shake the heavens, the earth, and the sea, and the dry land. That tells you when this is happening. I'm going to shake all nations. The desire of all nations will come. Jesus come into every nation. And then what? I'm going to fill this house, this end time house that's become strong and been doing the word and has come to the place of perfection. They're going to be filled with glory. The glory of God is coming into the end time church. It's going to be tremendous. The glory of the latter house will be greater than the former. It's only going to come to those who are, are water pots filled up with the word that have a river in them. You've got to get the river in you. In this place will I give completeness, shalom, completeness, saith the Lord of hosts. Well, we also see over in Psalms it speaks of this because remember this is the time of the great shaking that's occurring. Tremendous shaking that's going to happen. Otherwise, you've got to be out having your eyes on the Lord when everything's going crazy in the earth. And it will be. Psalms 46.1 God's our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Because remember, the tribulation is the greatest time of trouble that's ever come to the earth. It's coming. Therefore will we not fear. No fear. You get rid of fear out of your life. Though the earth be removed, both things are happening. Things are being altered would be a better way to understand it. It's being changed or they're being altered because of all the upheaval that's occurring. And though the mountains be carried in the midst of the sea, tremendous <laughs> earthquakes, volcanoes, shaking, whatever. Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, and be earthquakes and, or volcanoes. But what does he say happens at the same time? There's a river. The streams whereof shall make the city glad, the city of God. And the city of God is the place where he has come to dwell because we're, we can be referred to as a city. This river is in this city. And this is the, the body of Christ that have come to the place of the completion of the work. And what is it? It's the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. Who's God going to come and tabernacle in? Only those that have made him their habitation and come and seen the complete work accomplished in their life. We'll come back to this in a moment. Ephesians chapter 2. Remember, all the building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord. You and I are growing up to the holy temple. For what? You're building together for a habitation of God. Well, that means God's going to manifest his abode through the Spirit. It's going to happen. That's exactly what this is talking about. The habitation of God. Because we see that he, the river of God is in the body of Christ. The place of the tabernacles of the Most High God. We've come to that holy place seeing this work of God completely accomplished in our life. And notice, God is in the midst of her. God's going to be in you. God's going to be in all of us if we have met the conditions. She shall not be moved. You're not going to be moved in the midst of all every, of the tremendous upheaval going on in the earth, everything's shaken. If you get moved, you're not going to be a part of this group because you can't have any fear. God shall help her. And that right early means that the more break of day, the morning means at the very beginning of the seventh month, excuse me, the seventh day, which is the time of the judgments beginning to pour out, but also the time when all the devils are going to be cast down and they're going to be going after. First, they go after the Jews, but God protects them because they get moved out into a safe place and get the gospel and get born again. And remember, a flood goes and swallows up, you know, the earth opens up and swallows up the water. But then he goes after who? The remnant who have the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. God will help you, and he'll be right there to protect you as long as you're not moved. And if you've got the rivers of living water in you and you don't fear, and you're watching, and you're holy, and you've got your garments on, and you're operating in your authority, and you are walking in the way of the Lord, he will protect you. The heathen raged. Oh, they're going to be going crazy. 
everything you're going to read or hear out there in the news media and all the different things, they're going to be going absolutely crazy. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. That's what's going to happen. The Lord of hosts is with us. God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he's made in the earth. Why is he doing that? It's the judgment upon the nations. Remember when all the judgments came on Egypt, the people in Goshen were protected. The people in Goshen represent those who are going to are a type of those who are going to be the glorious church, the remnant, the ones that are not moved, the ones where God is in her midst. The tremendous things are going to happen. This is going to be the fulfillment of coming to the fulfillment of tabernacles. But what will happen when this judgment is over on the seventh month, tenth day, five days later begins the seventh month, fifteenth day, which will begin the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. That is the second fulfillment. The second fulfillment, we see it in Revelation chapter 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. <clears throat> no, on such the second death hath no power. Well, that means we were in the glorified, we, got, we were in the rapture and the, got the glorified bodies and went to heaven, the marriage of the Lamb, and came back and saw the judgment. The second death has no authority. They shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with Him a thousand years in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. It's tremendous what He'll do. And during this time, by the way, Jesus is going to be ruling with a, reign of, uh, with a rod of iron. I mean, it's going, nobody's going to get away with anything. The Word of God will rule and reign. That's what's supposed to have been happening, but it's not ever happened in any of the nations, unfortunately. Zechariah 14.9, The Lord shall be king over all the earth. He's taken it back. In that day there shall be one Lord, His name one. He's going to be the one ruling and reigning. The king, there will only be one. Nobody else, they won't be ruling or reigning whatsoever. We come down to verse 16. These nations are all going to be destroyed, see, and the ones that repopulate. There's going to be one king, and they have to observe him. Because verse 16 says, It shall come to pass, <clears throat> everyone that's left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem, there's only going to be a few men left, remember, shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the memorial of what he has accomplished. He came. He accomplished the redemption and everything, all the things in his first coming. And then he's come and taken back the earth and brought the millennial reign. He's now the king over all the earth. Now, it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no reign. God will still is a God of judgment, remember. It's not like there won't be judgments. There'll be judgments happening for those who are rebellious that won't do what, what's right. If the family of Egypt go not up, Egypt's a type of the world, remember, <clears throat> come not, they have, and come not, that have no rain. There shall be a plague. Not only will they not have rain, but they're going to get plagues upon them. God will put, bring plagues upon them. Wherewith the Lord shall smite the heathen that come up, not up to the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. They're going to be punished if they don't. The Feast of Tabernacles is the memorial of him coming to do something, him coming on the scene to tabernacle to accomplish this tremendous work. Now, there's a third fulfillment. The third fulfillment, fulfillment is after the thousand years are over, the earth is going to be burn up in the heavens, and it's going to be a brand new heaven and a brand new earth that is going to come. Revelation 21, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there's no more sea. There won't be any sea in the new heaven and the new earth. It'll be gone. I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Ah, the new Jerusalem is now going to come. I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle, skene. This is the fulfillment of the third fulfillment and the final fulfillment of tabernacles. The tabernacle of God is with men, and he shall dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them 
and be their God. Tremendous. We're going to be with the Father and Jesus. God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. <clears throat> and of course, he's going to make all things new. He says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's going to do all these things. Now, who's going, to, who's going to be there with him? He that conquers and overcomes, conquers and carries off the victory, continually, present tense, shall inherit all things. And I'll be his God, and he shall be my son. Remember, he's coming, and we're going to be, he's going to be God, and we're going to be son, son to him. The ones that are going to make it are the ones who are conquerors. God wants you to conquer everything. You are a conqueror. You are well able to conquer and overcome. Don't let anything slide. All sin needs to be eliminated. Everything that's of the devil needs to be driven out of your life. You get rid of anything that's contaminating, anything that would defile you in any manner. It all needs to be eliminated. And one last scripture, Revelation 22, verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that are doing his commandments, <coughs> excuse me, continually, present tense, that they may have authority, exousia, <coughs> excuse me, means authority, to the tree of life. Or more literally, that the authority shall be theirs under the tree of life. <coughs> and by the gates they, should, they might enter into the city. Otherwise, you have to meet the conditions to be able to enter in the city because when it says enter, it's a subjunctive mood. Meaning, who's going to get in there? Only the ones who are doing his commandments. They're the only ones that have the authority as theirs to the tree of life. And those are the only ones having met the conditions that can enter into the gates into the city, the new Jerusalem. Praise God. Tremendous. Tabernacles, oh, these feasts are so important to understand. The first fulfillment, Jesus coming, and he was born at Tabernacles, possibly on the 17th day. The day is not important. It's the fact that it was at Tabernacles. December 25th is a lie. Anybody that observes 20, December 25th is an idolatry, and you're in trouble. Any church that has anything to do with it is in trouble. Anybody that puts a tree up that's an idolatry, it's a denial of the Lord, and it's declaring that that the devil overcame the true and living God. That's what the tree represents. It's all idolatry, and it's all a denial of Jesus Christ. You remember, December 25th is the birthday of the unconquered sun god, that the pagan church way back there, they merged the church with the paganisms, and they appointed December 25th the birth of Jesus. <laughs> it's not the birthday of Jesus. It was the birthday of the unconquered sun god which is the devil, essentially, pointing towards him because they would worship the sun god. It's all false. So you can't have anything to do with that whatsoever. Why are Christians so slow in churches? It's ast astounding that they won't get rid of the paganism. They should have nothing to do with it whatsoever. It is an abomination to God. The true fulfillments are Jesus came and was born at Tabernacles. He accomplishes tremendous work. And then the second fulfillment is he's coming back to take back the earth, bring all the judgments, bring the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, and he'll be ruling with a rod of iron. Everything will be according to the word of God. There'll be no more war whatsoever. <laughs> and nobody's going to get away with any rebellion or anything. He's going to be ruling and reigning according to the word of God throughout that thousand year period. And then after that, because the earth has been affected adversely, of course, it's got new heavens, new earth, it's all going to be brand new. And we're going to have a brand new city that we're going to be entering into, having met the conditions, the new Jerusalem. And the Father is going to come. And you and I, if we have met all the conditions, are going to be dwelling with the Father and Jesus for eternity. I'll tell you, understanding all that, you got to put God first place in your life. You got to put this, get His Word in you. You got to become a water pot full of the Word of God. You need to do everything that the Word says. Don't make any mistakes and walk contrary to the ways of the Word of God. Hear it, do it, walk in it, obey, conquer, 
every enemy, carry out everything that we mention. We can't have any sin. And also we're going to be ambassadors, warning other people, sharing the truth with them, calling them to receive the Lord, do the work of evangelists, carry out everything that He wants. This is the message, the good news. But also, you remember, God is a righteous God. He, of course, the righteous are going to be with Him, but the unrighteous and the ungodly are going to be judged. He will not have anybody that's not righteous and holy with Him. Praise God for the tremendous work that He has accomplished and will continue to accomplish and what we have to look forward to. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the revelation of the work in the seventh month, in the Feast of Trumpets, with all the warnings and dealing with sin, engaging in the warfare, doing what the Word says, building our foundation, wanting the Word, getting the understanding, becoming a water pot filled up with the Word. And I understand the Day of Atonement fulfillment, which was liberty. We get restored to the family when we're born again by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we get delivered from all the evil and restoration of all of our possessions as we get healed and delivered. And we come to the place of total liberty and restoration of all things. I thank you for understanding tabernacles as well, that Jesus came and was born at tabernacles and accomplishes this great work in our life to bring us to the place of perfection for the glorious church, which will occur at the very end of the church age for those who've met the conditions. I thank you for also understanding the final judgment, the final fulfillment of the Day of Atonement, the judgments upon the nations. And Jesus then will begin to rule and reign in the millennial reign. And as I have met the conditions, I will be ruling and reigning with him for a thousand years. And then the final fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles, when the new heavens and the new earth, that we will be with the Father and we will have the right to enter into the city and authority to the tree of life and we'll be with the Father and Jesus forever. Thank you. I am walking in the ways of the Word of God 100% and I will see the total work be accomplished so I will be with Him in the new heavens and the new earth. Thank you for the great work you're accomplishing and the revelation of the truth in the Word of God, in Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Father, we thank you for everyone understanding the days we're in, the fulfillment in the seventh month of all the things that are happening and will happen, and our responsibility to carry out the things that you've told us to do so that we meet the conditions, so that we will rule and reign with you and be with you forever. Thank you for accomplishing the great work in all of our lives because we're all hearers and doers of your word. In Jesus' name, amen.